So this is a very big topic with um, lots of anatomy. Um, so I'll try and give you some hints and tips when you're looking through a CT scan um, that may help you um, understand sort of what's going on. So we'll talk through some next spaces, key anatomy and important anatomy with regards to pathology. So I think this, if you don't remember anything else from my talk, I think this is the best bit of anatomical information on CT that an MRI that I learned is the five point rule. So we said we start at the skull base. So this is an axial CT on bone windows and this is an axial T1 image. Um, so on T1, bone marrow is fatty, like the subcutaneous fat. So all bone with marrow in it should look, um, should look bright. And what you're looking for are the pterygoid plates. So you should see two nice pterygoid plates. The body of the sphenoid, which is here. And the petrous temporal bones which is here. So if you just start any scan at the top and just make sure all those five things are present, skull base is intact pretty much. So I'm gonna start with the nasopharynx. Now I'm gonna split the neck up into various compartments, but as I've said at the beginning, we scan from skull base to the carina because we make up these boundaries between anatomy, but there's no actual barrier that's stopping the tumor or infection going there. So that's why you still have to interrogate everything, uh, every region, because things can just spread and you just have to make sure you look for it. So we'll start with the nasopharynx, which goes from skull base uh, to the soft palate. And this is the sagittal version. And this is an axial contrast soft tissue CT showing the nasopharynx. And I borrowed this picture because I think this is what it looks like when you look up through a scope through the left nostril, which doesn't make any sense to me. <laughs> um, so the nasopharynx on CT or MR should be always filled with air. Basically, it should look black. There shouldn't really ever be anything in it. And so I'll show you one here and the next slide will just reiterate it. This is the fossa of Rosenmuller. So that's the posterior structure, which is what you see when you look up. This is the torus tubarium, which is the uh, cartilaginous portion of the eustachian tube, which is here. And this is the eustachian tube, which you'll just see here. I'll just move on to the next slide, which I've just labeled the key sort of things we look for on cross-sectional imaging as radiologists. So again, the fossa of Rosenmuller, which is the commonest site for nasopharyngeal carcinoma, which is rare, but actually we've been having at least four or five cases per year in Norwich. So it's gradually creeping up and it terrifies the oncologists because they don't see it that much and how to treat it can be very tricky. Um, the eustachian tube, is this tube anteriorly here. Now the pharynga basilar fascia, it's, it's quite difficult to see normally, but it's basically the covering around the um, nasopharynx. It's really important in staging. So if somebody does have nasopharyngeal carcinoma, if it's broken through this um, pharynga basilar fascia, that, um, can upgrade it and um, means they're more at risk from um, nodal disease. And I'll show you more on the coronal images, but the levator palatini muscle is an important thing, particularly with tumour or infection, because that can be basically something that the tumour or infection can hang on to and then happily travel out of the nasopharynx up to skull base and down into um, all of the other fat planes. And the most important thing, which we'll come on to a bit later as well, is the parapharyngeal fat, which is a really important bit of anatomy. So again, if you can hang on to the parapharyngeal fat, um, that is an important bit. So this is my coronal image, and this is my attempt at a diagram. 
Um, so this is the nasopharynx on my diagram. This is the nasopharynx on my uh, coronal T1 image. And you've got the pharyngobasilar fascia, which is actually much more tightly applied to the nasopharynx than on my little diagram. But this is the levator palatini muscle, which is here. And this is my diagram. So you can see if tumor decides I'm going to come out on my pharyngobasilar fascia, that will take it because that is a weak point in that pharyngobasilar fascia there. It will it'll happily climb out. Before you know it, you're on the trigeminal nerve and you're heading up to the skull base and you've got tri um, perineural spread. So that's why that is an important bit of anatomy and that would make it inoperable and mean it's out to skull base. And so this is our normal nasopharynx levator palatini muscle, foramen ovale where the uh, trigeminal nerve runs. And obviously this is grossly abnormal. This tumor's come out into this parapharyngeal fat. You can't see that there. And it's gone up through the foramen ovale. This is the internal carotid and where the cavernous sinus can be. So you can just see as soon as it finds a weak spot, it'll just travel through it. I'm sure even as most of you guys are ENT boffs, you'll be taught this, I presume by your bosses. Somebody who comes in recurrent middle ear effusions, look at the nasopharynx because there could be um, a tumor that's obstructing the eustachian tube causing that middle ear effusion. So um, I guess that's for the non-ENT people in the audience. So moving on to neck spaces. Because like I said, there's so much to cover and I'm trying to make this um, kind of just things you can hang your hat on when you're looking at a scan and trying to look at it logically. So I've done it in diagram form, first of all. So I talked about this parapharyngeal space, pharyngeal fat. And basically we make that the center of our little world of neck spaces. And We've got the masticator space, which is anterior to the pharyngeal, parapharyngeal fat, the carotid space, which is posterior to it, the parotid space, which is lateral to it, and the pharyngeal mucosal space with the oropharynx medial to it. And why is this important? Well, it can help us decide where a mass is coming from. So if there was a mass in the carotid space, which is behind the parapharyngeal fat, that should push the parapharyngeal fat anteriorly. If there's a mass in the masticator space, that should push the parapharyngeal fat posteriorly. If there's a mass in the parotid space, which is lateral, the parapharyngeal fat will be pushed medially. And if there's something in the oropharynx, that will push the parapharyngeal fat laterally. Okay. So this is it on an axial T1. So in yellow here, this is my parapharyngeal fat, which is bright because it's fat. This is the masticator space. So you've got your masseter muscle, your medial and lateral pterygoid muscles and a bit of your temporalis muscle. These are your carotid vessels, which is posterior to the fat. And this is your parotid gland, which is lateral to the fat. Okay, so center of the world, masticator anterior, carotid posterior, pharyngeal mucosal space medial, parotid space lateral. Okay, so this is my axial T1 again, and we've got a mass. So this is the parapharyngeal fat on the left, and it's very difficult, it's, you know. It's never that easy in real life, but we've got the vessels here which are being pushed forward and the fat is being pushed forward as well. So in this case, I would make a guess that potentially this mass is based within the carotid space, potentially. And then my next example, we've got this lobulated mass within the parapharyngeal fat. 
And the carotid vessels are where they are. The masticator space is where it should be. And the carotid gland is where it should be. And so this mass is probably centered within the parapharyngeal fat because it's not really moved. Um, so that's how an example of how we can try and use the parapharyngeal fat to decide where um, abnormalities lie, but it's not always that straightforward. Moving on to the oropharynx, so that from the soft palate to the hyoid bone. So key anatomy on CT. So the soft palate, which includes the uvula, and then you've got your anterior tonsillar pillar and the posterior tonsillar pillar. So I'll go into those into more detail. So they're actually muscles. We call them pillars. They're sort of part of the soft palate. And then you've got your, ooh, you've got your palatine tonsils and your tongue base. So we'll just look at these in a bit more detail. So again, this is my diagram and this is cutting through us in the axial plane. And this is somebody opening their mouth. <laughs> and so you can see the uvula here and you've got your palatine tonsils and in front of the palatine tonsil, you've got your anterior tonsillar pillar and behind your palatine tonsil, you've got your posterior tonsillar pillar. And that's what I've tried to um, demonstrate on my little diagram. So you've got your uvula here. So you're cutting through the uvula in the axial plane here. And you, anteriorly, you've got your anterior tonsillar pillar, which is the palatal glossus muscle. And the posterior tonsillar uh, pillar, which is your palatal pharyngeal muscle. And in between these anterior and posterior pillows lie your palatine tonsils. And I'll just show you again. So this is, I guess, what you guys love looking at um, and see. So you've got your uvula, you've got your palatine tonsils, your posterior tonsillar pillar, which is the palatal pharyngeus muscle. And, the, and my phone keeps thinking it's talking to me. And your anterior tonsillar pillar, which is this palatal glossus muscle. So for radiologists, we find this um, an important muscle because if a patient has a tumour of their anterior tonsillar pillar, this palatal glossus muscle goes all the way down to the tongue base. So we have to be sure that we follow it all the way down because the tumour could be more extensive than we think it is. Um, so we just need to make sure that we've covered all of that. So tongue base um, covers the posterior third of the tongue. The anterior to the thirds of the tongue is the oral, um, the oral tongue and therefore max fax territory. Um, so posterior thirds of the tongue includes the lingual tonsils, also includes the voleculi, and we've got the posterior third, the lingual tonsils and the voleculi. And then I'm showing this as well because we can, you can see the uh, epiglottis uh, with, when we look at the base of tongue. And here forming the voleculi, you've got your glossoepiglottic fold and your pharyngoepiglottic folds, but these are actually laryngeal structures. So they call the, epi, uh, the epiglottis the, um, the imposter because it appears at the same level as the oropharynx, but actually it's a laryngeal structure. So extrinsic tongue muscles. So we've got lots, you've got intrinsic tongue muscles and extrinsic tongue muscles. The extrinsic tongue muscles, uh, I think can change the position and shape of the tongue. Um, and why are they important? Well, they're important for radiological staging because if a tongue tumour involves the extrinsic tongue muscles, it upgrades it to a T4 tumour. So the important ones that I personally look for, or the ones that I can find, are obviously the palatal glossus muscle, which we looked at, that comes down from the anterior tonsillar pillar, and the genior glossus muscles, and the higher glossus muscles. And so this is the genior glossus muscles here. And actually, interestingly, PATH really struggle with deciding whether extrinsic tongue muscles are involved. So unusually, obviously, because PATH is normally the gold standard, radiology is the one to basically say whether this is a T4 tumour or not. And this is an example of a tongue-based tumour. And you can see the genia glossus muscle here, and you can just see it nibbling into that um, 
edema glossus muscle on the right and it's extending to the midline and actually crossing the midline and probably involving the epiglottis. So this is probably a T4 tumour because it's involving the um, extrinsic tongue muscles. If it wasn't involving the extrinsic tongue muscles and involving the epiglottis, that would make it T3. Um, so we've done the anterior neck spaces. Now we've got the, the posterior neck spaces. So we've got the prevertebral muscles, which we'll use as our central point. So anterior to the prevertebral muscles is the retropharyngeal space. And posterior to the prevertebral muscles, we've got the prevertebral space, which you can't really see because basically the muscles uh, plumb up against the vertebral bodies. So again, I've got my little uh, axial T1 image. So I've got my prevertebral muscles here. And this green line is the prevertebral uh, the pre yeah, the pre space. So you can't really see anything in there and there shouldn't because they should be up against it. And then you've got your retropharyngeal space anterior to the prevertebral muscles. And these are your carotid arteries. So, am I? I'll talk about retropharyngeal nodes. Um, actually, I might talk about them now because I'm not sure if I have got a slide on them because that obviously for you guys, if you're gonna operate on something, you, you would not be keen to go fishing out retropharyngeal nodes. So you've got medial and lateral retropharyngeal nodes. In kids, they're just so nodey, they've got nodes everywhere and you quite often see medial retropharyngeal nodes and lateral retropharyngeal nodes. The nodes we see with oropharyngeal and nasopharyngeal cancers are lateral, nas uh, lateral retropharyngeal nodes, which are just medial to the carotid artery. And you do have to look for them, basically. It's another one of these things. Um, if you don't look for them, you won't see them. So if you look for the internal carotid artery and look medial to it, that's where you'll find retropharyngeal nodes. And it's important because if they're considering surgery, that probably puts them out of surgery into chemotherapy range. So this is an example of a posterior pharyngeal tumor. And you can see here, these are the um, prevertebral muscles here. And it, this tumor sort of almost split the prevertebral muscle, the uh, paravertebral muscles, and it's coming up to the vertebral body. Now, we struggle in radiology, um, and we're expecting more and more out of radiology, but unless it's really invading the vertebral body, um, I would just describe that as abutting it, because you never know, if you went in surgically, you could just peel that off, and that would be fine. Okay, just a quick bit about the floor of mouth, as I know we don't often do that. Um, so we've got the mylar hyoid muscle and the genia hyoid muscle. So these are actually floor of mouth muscles. Um, and then you've got your genia hyoid and your higher glossus, with uh, genia glossus and your higher glossus muscles, which are extrinsic tongue muscles. And these are your anterior digastric muscles. And this is what it looks like on ultrasound. So these are your anterior digastric muscles. This is your mylar hyoid muscle, which looks like a sling. And this is the tongue muscles here. So larynx and hypopharynx. Um, so the larynx is the anterior tube and the hypopharynx is the posterior tube. And that extends from the hyoid bone to the inferior aspect of the cricoid cartilage. So the hypopharynx starts at the level of the pharyngoepiglottic fold, and it's this posterior tube that extends down to the cricoid cartilage. Okay. So you've got the piriform sinuses, which are these lateral air-filled collections here, and then you've got your areapiglottic fold. And the posterior aspect of your areapiglottic fold it's part of the hypopharynx, and the rest of the area epiglossic fold is laryngeal. So this is the normal piriform fossa on the left, and this is obviously an abnormal piriform fossa with abnormal soft tissue, narrowing the piriform fossa, and actually creeping into what we call the preepiglottic fat around that 
thyroid cartilage and into the strap muscles. So the larynx, um, so we can split that into the supraglottis, the glottis and the glot subglottis, but this is all laryngeal. This is why head and neck anatomy gets so complicated because there's so many subsections. So the supraglottis consists of your suprahyoid epiglottis, so your imposter, your laryngeal imposter, your infrahyoid epiglottis, the laryngeal aspect, the anterior aspect of your area epiglottic fold, and the false cords. Okay. So this is an example of a supraglottic tumor that doesn't involve the false cords. And this is an example of a false cord tumor. So this is the paraglottic fat here and the tumors involving the paraglottic fat. So when we see the, the false cords, we normally see the paraglottic fat next to it. So we know that it's the false cord. When we see the glottis, which is pure muscle, we don't see the paraglottic fat. The easiest way to know when you're at the level of the vocal cords is when you see the cricoid cartilage and the retinoid cartilage is on the same image on the axial slice. And this is what I was talking about, uh, effect of respiration. So this is what we used to do. The patient would hold their breath and the vocal cords are completely opposed. So you've got no chance of identifying a tumor on that. But this is the same patient when we got them to shallow breathe. And here you can see the vocal cords are not opposed and there's irregularity and enhancement of that left vocal cord. So fat is your friend. Um, so we've seen on the axial T1 images that bone marrow is fat. And this is the pre-epiglottic fat and the paraglottic fat that I've mentioned before. So when you're looking through a scan, particularly laryngeal scan, you want to look and see if these fats are involved because that will upstage the patient. And that's not something you'll be able to see when you look down with your nasendoscope. So this is a tumor involving the, the pre-epiglottic fat. It's the hyoid bone. And again, the pre-epiglottic fats involved. And this is normal nice paraglottic fat. And this is tumor extending into the paraglottic fat and actually eroding the thyroid cartilage. Thyroid cartilage involvement is not always this simple. Um, this is obviously a large laryngeal tumor that's eroded through the thyroid cartilage into the strap muscles. They can have variable ossification as we mentioned in the, um, in the first talk I did. And also you can get odd variations and bending of the um, thyroid cartilage. Um, so it's just aware to be very aware of variations and really carefully inspect the inside and outside uh, soft tissues when you're looking at the thyroid cartilage. Subglottis, there should be no abnormal soft tissue. When you look at the, um, car, uh, the cricoid, it should be pristine. There should be no bobbly bits. So if you see anything asymmetrical, you'd be worried about a tumor because these patients present late. So the sooner you can pick them up, the earlier. And obviously, unfortunately, this is usually how patients present with circumferential abnormal soft tissue extending through the cartilages into the strap muscles. And so my last slide. So I should have put a poll for this but I'm sure you're all shouting at the screen saying, oh, that's the thyrohyoid membrane <laughs> that we talked about earlier. So this is an extrinsic uh, laryngocele. So this is difficult for you guys, I think, to see when you look down with your nasendoscope endoscope because it can be submucosal and therefore you just see a smooth, I think you just see a smooth rounding. Whereas obviously on CT, we can see in that left vocal cord, it's, it's just pushed by a submucosal thing that is coming out into the uh, lateral soft tissues. And these can present as a neck mass. 
Um, but this is an example of a laryngocele. Obviously, there could be an underlying laryngeal tumour or the patient could be a glass blower or a trumpeter. And this is what it looks like on the coronal image. So you've got your thyroid cartilage and your hyoid bone. And this is poking out through that thyrohyoid membrane that I showed you in the first talk. So that's a lot to get through. Um, fat is your friend. I mean, the good thing is you've got another side to compare with, which I'm grateful for. Sometimes it's a nightmare when it's bilateral disease. Look at the nasopharynx in case of recurrent middle ear effusion and the five point rule for the skull base. So your pterygoid plates, your sphenoid um, base and your two petrous uh, temporal bones.